What up, Utes? This is Andrew checking with you guys. Do you remember this place? I know it's super weird, but uh, you may not remember. We actually used to like meet here and like worship God together. Uh, and then, you know, we would like hang out and stuff like that. I know, crazy to think about. Uh, in all seriousness, checking in from you guys, uh, with you guys from the sanctuary. Uh, hope you guys are well. Uh, you know, hoping that we can get back here uh, because, you know, it's not that I don't love seeing your faces on Zoom. It's just I would prefer to see your faces uh, in person. I know, tender. But uh, we are going to keep going this week with the youth blog uh, right now. And so the last few weeks, hope you guys have been able to check in. We've done something uh, a little different, a lot of different, actually, uh, where we looked at something uh, called the spiritual disciplines for a couple of weeks with prayer, fasting, and meditation. Hopefully just to give you guys a little something different uh, to try out with maybe some of your extra spare time that you have being sheltered in place and things like that. So uh, if you want to check those out, you can. Uh, but at the same point, we're going to jump back into some books of the New Testament now uh, and do a little bit more of study there, have a little bit more discussion, hopefully, with your small group leaders, with your parents, and it'll be good. So the first book that we're going to look at, uh, we're going to do the next couple of series, uh, will be some smaller, more obscure books in the New Testament. And the first one we're going to look at is Philemon. So uh, one thing I would love for you guys to do if you need to pause the video or whatever else is just read Philemon. Uh, this will make a lot more sense afterwards and that kind of stuff. Also, Philemon is one chapter. It's like 23 verses or something like that. And if you cannot commit to read 23 verses, then I'm not going to resign as your youth pastor, but man, like... We got a long way to go. Like it's 23 verses. It'll take you three minutes. I believe in you. Use your words that they taught you in the schools. You can do it. All right. So hopefully you have read Philemon and you guys are ready to go. Uh, and you see that it's kind of a weird story. Uh, first and foremost, uh, maybe we need to decide how we're supposed to say this word uh, because it can look like Philemon to us, which I think is a Pokemon, uh, but that doesn't sound too right. Uh, maybe it's Philemon, but then we think about Philippians, and I don't say Philippians, so we're just going to stick with Philemon at, for this point. Uh, but this guy named Philemon is getting a letter from Paul. Obviously, they know each other from some point, and if you look back in Acts, there is a reference to Philemon as well. Uh, but they have some sort of reference to each other. And basically, Philemon has a servant or a slave named Onesimus. I know that looked like one Simus, but again, it's Onesimus. We'll get through the names together. We'll be good. But Onesimus actually runs away from Philemon's household. And somewhere uh, when he is off running away uh, in rebellion, uh, he ends up finding Paul in prison. And while he's in prison, uh, Paul shares the gospel with Onesimus, and then uh, Onesimus actually becomes a believer. And so that is why Paul is now sending him back to Philemon. But he's given some different instructions to him. Uh, some things that are really cool that I want to point out to you guys where he's saying that, yeah, this guy Onesimus, he was a runaway slave. You know, he left your family. You know, he left you in a lot of hurt and whatever else. And remember, slave does not mean the same thing that we think of uh, with our country's history. There was much more mistreatment and things like that. It would have been sort of like somebody working for somebody at that point. Uh, but anyway, so he leaves uh, Philemon's household, and then he goes and he finds Paul. And Paul says that he was once worthless to you and worthless to me, but now he is so valuable. He is so valuable. He has so much that he can bring to the table. And what's he talking about? Well, we remember the gospel message, the thing that we've talked about uh, for uh, hopefully every week, but uh, the thing that we continue to talk about is this idea that sin separates us from God, obviously, right? You know, the darkness and the light and things like that. We're in the darkness naturally and sin. Uh, and we realize that God can't do really anything with us when we're in sin because God is separated from sin. He's holy. He's set apart. And so therefore, when we're in sin, when we're in rebellion, we're kind of worthless to God. It's hard to say, not really fun to admit, but it's true. And then when Jesus comes into our lives, when we realize that Jesus is the cure to our sin problem, when Jesus is coming to give us life and life eternally back with the Father, as it was intended to be, as it was created to be, when we realize that, that is when we can have value again because we can be in life and fellowship with the Father. In the same way, what Paul is saying is Onesimus was once this rebel that was just against uh, Philemon, was, you know, left him in hurt, left him all this pain. But now he's coming in repentance and he understands the error of his ways and he's going to be so much more valuable to you now. He's going to be a better servant to you now. He's going to do his job more effectively now because he understands 
who Jesus is, and he is going to act on that. He is going to be loving and kind and do the things that God's called him to do, which is going to make him more valuable to you, Philemon, which is really cool when we think about the gospel and how that transforms us from death to life, from not valuable to valuable. Paul's saying the same thing has happened to Onesimus in this passage. Another thing, too, that I think really cool, really represents the gospel, maybe you caught when Paul was talking about, I know it's going to be hard to accept him, but at the same point, take him back into the household, and whatever he owes you, charge that to me. I, Paul, will pay back whatever Onesimus owes you, Philemon. What does Paul have to gain in this? Nothing, right? This is just some guy they met in prison, after all. But Paul loves Onesimus, and he doesn't want him to have these debts or these burdens that he has to carry anymore. And so Paul says, I'll pay those debts. I'll take care of that. So Onesimus doesn't have to do that anymore, or he doesn't have to worry about that anymore, and that you two can be back in fellowship with each other. Sound familiar? Huh? Think about the gospel. Jesus saying, yeah, those aren't my sins that these people have committed, but I love them, and I don't want this debt to be carrying over them so they can no longer be in fellowship with the Father. I want them to have the opportunity to be reconnected with the Father. And so put those debts on me, on Calvary's cross, right? I will pay those gladly. Just charge those to my accounts so that these people can be back with the Father. And Paul's saying that now, charge whatever Onesimus owes to me so that you two can be back in fellowship with each other. And what a clear picture of the gospel that is and how cool that is as well. And think about how much Paul sticks up for Onesimus, how great a friend he is, how great a mentor, a leader he is to him. Even later in the passage, you know, Paul has been saying, he's like, I appeal to you, please accept him back in. But then he says something that doesn't make a lot of sense until we think about it. He says, prepare a guest room for me because I'm planning on coming to visit you. It's like, why does that make any sense? But then we realize Paul's saying, I'm appealing to you in love. I want you to do this. But this is the right thing to do, so I'm going to make sure, Philemon, that you do this. This is how Christ has loved us. This is the example that he has set for us, and so I'm going to make sure that you do this. Man, Paul is killing it in Philemon. All right, he is, I mean, he is doing great things for Onesimus, but he's also calling his brother Philemon to obedience. He's making sure that he's going to go and follow through the things that God's called him to do. And so he's a great leader and mentor to Onesimus, and then he's this great advocate for Onesimus, but then he's also somebody who calls Philemon to do the hard things that God has called him to do, even though he may not feel like it, even though it may not make sense to him. Submit to the authority of the Father and know that this is what he's calling us to do. And that's a great lesson for us as well and something that we should strive for not only in our friendships but also to be that friend for other people. So not only should we look for friends like Paul is to Onesimus and to Philemon in this passage, but we should also look to be Paul for other people in our lives, to be an advocate for people, to help people out, to go and serve them, to go and take their burdens as, as our own but also, too, to call people to obedience, even when it's tough, even when maybe peer pressure sets in or whatever else you guys may be facing, to call people, no, this is still the way to life. Obedience in God is the way to life, and anything else leads to death. Anything else is in the flesh, is in sin. And so for life to happen, we have to follow this, even if it's difficult, even if it's hard. We have to do this. And so I want you guys to think about that for a while. Think about these questions. Think about a time in your life where you really received forgiveness, but you didn't really deserve it. Think about what did Onesimus do to receive forgiveness from Philemon? Nothing. But he's going to receive it. Was a time when you think about either with a relationship with a parent or a friend that you've received forgiveness when you didn't deserve it. Then I want you to think about the gospel in this passage. Think about how Paul exemplifies what the gospel is for us, and what are some things that we can do in response to that in our own lives. So how can we selflessly give of ourselves to other people in our lives, whether as parents, siblings, friends? <clears throat> Excuse me, just a little clearing on the throat. I'm good. Don't worry. Thank you for your concern, though. Appreciate that. Think about the ways that we can selflessly give to our family and friends the way that Paul gives himself to Onesimus, literally saying, I will take every bad thing that this guy has done to you and charge that to me. Blame me for that. 
What are some ways that we can selflessly love the people around us? And then finally, what are some ways that we can call other people to holiness, call other people to obedience? And moreover, what are some ways that people can call us to holiness and obedience? When real friendship starts, when deep, deep, deep friendship starts, is when we start telling people the truth, even though it's not the things that they want to hear, right? Now, we tell it in love. We don't tell it something that, you know, is like, I'm better than you, I'm smarter than you, I know everything. But we tell the truth in love because we know that we can leave people in sin, we can leave people in disobedience, and it may not be awkward, all right? It may you know, be comfortable for us. We don't have to have a weird conversation or this tension in the relationship. But if we ultimately believe that when we're in sin or if our people are in sin, that that leads to death, there is no life in that, then the only loving thing for us to do is to call people back into life. The only loving thing to do is for us to submit when other people call us back into life, when we're screwing up, when we're in sin and disobedience. Because life is found in Christ, period. Life is only found in Christ, period. And so calling people back to fellowship with God in the same way Paul does Philemon at the end of this book is something huge for us. And how can we make that happen in our friendships? How can we make these deep relationships happen with our siblings, with our parents, with our friends, where we are calling each other to be better followers of Christ? What are some things that we can do with that? So I hope he gives you guys some stuff to chew on. I hope that you are able to understand and love the book of Philipp or the book of Philemon as I do. Uh, and man, thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you need me, obviously just reach out to me, man. I'd love to hear from you guys. I miss you guys. I'm hoping we can see you guys soon. But for now, I'm still praying for you guys. And I'm here for me from afar. So love you guys. Take care and we'll see you soon.